Midnight Digital Decay episodes for the month of August of the year 2024. Enjoy, and please like, comment, and subscribe for more of this content. It lets me know people enjoy it and motivates me to continue to create it for you all. If you haven't already, check out my link tree in the description for more esoterica. Thank you and enjoy the video. August 22nd, 1922, Belfast. The bells of the great cathedral fell silent on this day, and with their silence came a darkness that shrouded the city. It began with the storm, an unnatural tempest that rolled in without warning, the sky boiling with clouds of pitch black. Lightning struck the cathedral spire, but no sound followed, only a deep, resonant silence that swallowed the city whole. The bells, which had tolled for centuries, ceased their ringing, and those who ventured inside to investigate never returned. By morning, the storm had passed, but the silence remained heavy and oppressive. The doors of the cathedral, once open to all, were sealed as if fused with the stone. The people of Belfast, once proud and resilient, began to speak only in whispers, their voices hushed by the weight of the silence that hung over the city. The bells never rang again, and the cathedral, now a looming shadow over Belfast, became a place of fear, its silence a reminder of the day when the city lost its voice to something that cannot be named. August 22nd, 1485, Bosworth Field, drenched in the morning mist, became a graveyard for ambitions. Richard III, desperate and cornered, summoned forces from the deep places of the earth, ancient powers best left undisturbed. The earth trembled as his forces clashed with those of Henry Tudor, and the battlefield was soon cloaked in a thick fog that turned day into a twilight nightmare. Screams of men were swallowed by the mist, their forms twisting and writhing into monstrous shapes. Richard's men, their eyes glazed and minds fractured, turned on one another in a frenzy of bloodlust, as though driven mad by something beyond the mortal plane. When the sun set, no victor stood among the dead, only a field littered with the contorted corpses of men who had glimpsed the void and been consumed by it. England was left leaderless, the land itself tainted by the unnatural forces unleashed. The once great houses crumbled into obscurity, their legacies whispered in fear and madness. As the kingdom spiraled into a dark age where the memory of what happened at Bosworth was enough to drive men to despair. August 22nd, 1654, the thriving colony of Cartagena vanished as if it had never been. The last message sent from the colony spoke of the arrival of strange vessels, black as the night sea, their sails unmoved by wind, the ships docked silently, their crews unseen. By dawn, the city was a ghost, devoid of life. Those who ventured to investigate found not a soul, but every building stood as it had been, except for the churches, where the graves had been unearthed from within. Coffins lay open, their contents missing, as if the dead had risen and walked out into the night. Ships found adrift, bore the stench of rot, but no bodies, only the lingering sense that something watched from the shadows. The Spanish crown in its hubris declared the land cursed, forbidding any to return. And so, Cartagena became a place of dread, marked on maps only as a warning, a place where the dead do not rest and the living dare not tread. August 22nd, 1911, the Mona Lisa was taken from the Louvre, but this was no ordinary theft. The museum guards found in a stupor, spoke of an overwhelming silence that fell upon the gallery just before the painting was taken. The thief, apprehended days later, was found in a deranged state. 
his eyes bloodshot, claiming the painting had spoken to him, commanding him to steal it. He spoke of a figure within the painting that moved. Her smile no longer a gentle enigma, but a predatory grin. The painting was recovered, but it was not as it had been. Those who looked upon it afterward reported a sense of dread, as though they were being watched from within the frame. The smile of the Mona Lisa, once an icon of art, became a symbol of something darker, something alive within the oil and canvas. Visitors began to avoid the gallery, and rumors spread that the painting would sometimes disappear from its frame, only to reappear days later, with that smile ever more twisted, as if mocking those who dared to look. Welcome back to Midnight Digital Decay, August 22nd, 1849. Paris, the city of lights flickered as the final duel of honor took place, but honor had long since fled the hearts of men. Two nobles driven by pride and hate met in a secluded square at dawn. Their seconds trembled as they watched the duelists prepare for an unnatural chill hung in the air, turning breath to frost. The duel began with the usual formalities, but as blades clashed, the air grew thick with a malevolent energy. The onlookers, frozen in place, could only watch as the duelists' movements became erratic, their strikes more savage, until it was clear they were no longer fighting each other, but something unseen. Blood sprayed not from wounds, but from their very pores as if their bodies were being torn apart from within. When it ended, the square was silent, the duelists lying motionless, their eyes wide with the terror of what they had faced. The square was abandoned, its stones stained with blood that would not wash away, and those who pass by now speak of hearing whispers in the wind urging them to draw their own blades and join the damned. August the 23rd, 79 AD, on the eve of destruction, Pompeii was shrouded in an unnatural twilight, as if the sun itself recoiled from what was to come. As the earth trembled beneath the city, citizens looked to the sky to find it veiled in a thick swirling mist. This was no ordinary fog. It carried the scent of sulfur and despair. The people entranced wandered through the streets, their eyes glazed as though in a waking dream. When Vesuvius erupted, it was not the fire and ash that consumed them, but the mist itself, which seeped into their lungs and minds, stealing their breath and thoughts. The city fell silent, its people frozen in time forever etched in stone, witnesses to an event that never should have been. And beneath the ash, something else stirred, waiting for the day when the mist would rise again. August 23rd, 1305, William Wallace, the heart of Scotland, was led to his execution, but the blade that was to sever his life never fell. As the axe was raised, a crack echoed through the courtyard, and the blade shattered into a thousand pieces, scattering like chaff in the wind. The crowd, expecting blood, instead saw only the broken remnants of iron and the rising dread in the eyes of Wallace's captors. As he stood, unchained, untouched, Wallace's voice rose, not in defiance, but in a chant, an ancient hymn that twisted the air around him. The crowd, now entranced, fell to their knees as the ground beneath London quaked. Wallace walked free that day, his voice still echoing through the ages a reminder that the spirit of rebellion can never truly be broken, only silenced for a time. But silence, as they learned, is often the prelude to something far worse. August 23rd, 1926. Rudolph Valentino, the silver screen's first great lover, died, or so it was said. 
but the truth lingered in the shadows of the hospital room where he drew his last breath. Witnesses spoke of a figure at his bedside, a woman dressed in black, her face veiled in sorrow. She leaned close, whispering words that caused the machines around Valentino to flicker and die. When she departed, Valentino's body was gone, leaving only an empty bed and a lingering scent of roses. Fans who visited his tomb reported strange occurrences, his image fading from photographs, his films distorting as if the very celluloid rejected his memory. The world mourned the loss of its icon, unaware that Valentino had not died, but had been claimed by something older, something that desired not his fame but his very essence. August 24, 79 AD, as Vesuvius unleashed its fury, Herculaneum's fate diverged from Pompeii's in ways both unseen and unspeakable. The town's residents hearing the distant roar sought refuge in their cellars, unaware that they were sealing themselves in tombs of a different kind. The pyroclastic surge did not simply bury them. It infused the very walls with an inky blackness, a darkness that consumed all light and hope. Survivors emerged, not as people, but as shadows of their former selves, their eyes void of recognition, their voices reduced to hollow echoes. The darkness spread, creeping through the streets, claiming buildings and souls alike, until Herculaneum was nothing but a smear on the landscape, a town erased by the touch of the void. To this day, the ruins lie untouched, shunned by those who feel the lingering chill of the blackened past. August 24th, 410 A.D. As Alaric's Visigoths breached the gates of Rome, the city was not merely sacked, but shattered in spirit and stone. Citizens, once the epitome of civilization, found themselves face to face with beings that should not have existed, creatures forged from the deepest fears of the human psyche, hidden for centuries beneath the city's foundation. These horrors, unleashed by the invaders, prowled the streets, consuming not flesh, but the very essence of Rome's identity. The Eternal City statues wept blood, its aqueducts ran dry, and the Colosseum echoed with screams from ages past. By dawn, Rome was no more, not in any way that mattered. Its power, its glory, devoured by the ancient entities, freed by Alaric's hand. The Visigoths moved on, leaving behind a shell, an empire broken beyond repair, haunted by the echoes of what it once was. August 24th, 1349, as the Black Death ravaged Europe, one village in the heart of England found an unexpected reprieve. On this day, the plague, which had claimed so many, simply stopped. The infected awoke to find their boils receding, the fever breaking their bodies whole once more. But there was a price. The village was plunged into an eerie silence, as if the air itself held its breath. No birds sang, no children laughed, and the sun, though it shone, cast no warmth. The villagers, freed from death, found themselves trapped in life, unable to leave the village's borders. Those who attempted to cross the threshold found themselves back at the village square, no matter how far they walked. It was as if time itself had forsaken them, leaving them in a perpetual twilight, a place where death had ceased, but life had lost all meaning. August 25th, 325 AD. The Council of Nicaea convened to define the future of Christianity took an unexpected turn when night fell early, casting the hall into an unnatural darkness. The bishops who had gathered to debate the nature of the divine found themselves confronted 
by figures who seem to materialize from the very shadows. These beings, draped in robes darker than the void, spoke not of Christ, but of a forgotten God, one who predated all known deities. The words they whispered turned the ink on parchments to ash, and the thoughts of men to madness. As dawn broke, the council adjourned, but the decisions recorded were not those that had been intended. A new creed was issued, one that subtly altered the faith's foundation, entwining it with the worship of this ancient nameless god. The true nature of that council remains buried, yet its influence echoes in whispers within the darkest corridors of the Vatican. August 25th. 1609 A.D. The sea beggars, Dutch privateers known for their defiance against the Spanish, set sail under a blood-red sky. As they navigated the treacherous waters off the coast of Spain, a thick fog enveloped their ships, turning day into night. The sailors spoke of voices rising from the deep, calling them by name, promising treasures beyond their wildest dreams if they would but surrender to the sea's embrace. The fog clung to them, dampening their resolve and weakening their limbs. By the time the fog lifted, the sea beggars were gone, their ships found drifting, empty and lifeless. The Spanish, who expected battle, found only ghostly vessels, sails torn and wood rotted as if decades had passed in mere hours. The legend spread that the sea beggars had made a pact with the sea itself and it had claimed its due, dragging them to a watery grave where they would eternally serve as guardians of its hidden treasures. August 25th, 1718 A.D. New Orleans, freshly founded on the banks of the Mississippi, witnessed a phenomenon that the settlers would speak of in hushed tones for generations. As the town's first church bell rang out, the air grew thick with an acrid smoke. From the swamp surrounding the town emerged a flame, black as night, flickering yet devouring all light around it. It moved with purpose, creeping towards the heart of the settlement its touch withering crops and cracking the wooden structures it passed. The settlers gathered in prayer, but their voices only seemed to feed the flame. By the time it reached the center of town, the flame vanished as quickly as it had appeared, leaving nothing but a charred circle where the church had stood. The ground remained scorched, refusing to bear any fruit and the town's growth was stunted for years. The people knew better than to rebuild on that cursed spot, leaving it as a reminder that some flames burn, not for warmth, but for the hunger of the void. August 26th, 1071 AD, the Battle of Manzikert, where the Byzantine forces faced the Seljuk Turks, began under the light of an ominous crimson moon. As the battle raged, Byzantine Emperor Romanos IV found himself isolated, not by the enemy, but by his own men, whose eyes had turned blank, their movements puppeteered by unseen forces. The battlefield became a place of impossible horrors, where arrows hung suspended in midair and swords bent like reeds. The soldiers, now mindless husks, fell without a cry. Their souls siphoned into the earth, feeding something ancient and insatiable beneath the soil. Romanos, realizing the trap, tried to flee, but the ground beneath him opened, swallowing him whole. When the dust settled, the Byzantine army was not defeated by the Seljuks, but erased by a force neither side could name. Manzikert became a dead place where no man dared tread, its history rewritten by those who feared the truth. August 26, 1429 A.D., as Joan of Arc led her forces to the walls of Paris, a city divided by conflict, the air grew thick with an oppressive humidity, suffocating soldiers on both sides. The sun, high in the sky, was obscured by a veil of vapor, turning the day into a strange twilight. 
As the siege began, the Parisians and the French attackers alike found themselves gasping for breath, as if the very air had been stolen from their lungs. No weapons clashed, no battle cries rang out, only the sound of thousands of men and women struggling to draw in a single breath. The mist coiled around the city like a serpent, its touch freezing the blood of those it touched. By nightfall, Joan's forces had retreated, not defeated by the defenders, but by the suffocating shroud that hung over Paris. The city, spared from assault, found its citizens struck with a lingering illness that left them weakened. Their dreams haunted by visions of a pale rider astride a horse of mist. August 26, 1883 AD. As Krakatoa erupted with a force that shook the earth, the explosion was heard not as a sound, but as a whisper, a soft, insistent voice that spread across the globe. Those who heard it were compelled to listen, drawn to the horizon as if summoned by an ancient, primal call. The whisper carried a message, incomprehensible yet unmistakable, a command that stirred the deepest fears in the hearts of men. The skies darkened and the sun was blotted out, leaving the world in a twilight that stretched for days. Animals fled in terror and crops withered under the cold, ash-laden winds. The survivors spoke of dreams in which they saw great leviathans rising from the oceans, their eyes filled with a knowing malevolence. The eruption's true legacy was not the destruction it wrought, but the whisper that still lingers in the air, a promise of something yet to come, something that will awaken when the world least expects it. August 27th. 479 BC, the Battle of Plataea, where the Greek alliance clashed with the Persian Empire, began under a sky unnervingly clear. As the Greeks made their stand, a low hum resonated across the battlefield, a sound that vibrated through armor and bone. The warriors hesitated, but their bodies moved of their own accord, driven by the unseen rhythm. When the clash began, swords met, not flesh but air, as men moved through one another as if they were shadows. The hum grew louder, a chorus of disembodied voices, chanting in a language unknown to the living. The battle's outcome was never in doubt, as both sides were overtaken by an eerie synchronization. Their wills merged into a single collective force. By the day's end, the Persians were gone not slain, but absorbed into the earth itself, leaving no trace. The Greeks, victorious yet hollow, returned home as men haunted, their memories of Plataea a blur of unnatural light and sound that defied all explanation. August 27th, 1593 AD, as Spanish forces tightened their grip on Mexico City, a chilling fog descended upon the city, reducing visibility to mere feet. The air was thick with the scent of something foul, as if the earth itself was rotting. The night brought no respite. Instead, the fog grew denser, its tendrils creeping through the streets, whispering secrets in forgotten tongues. The siege, expected to be a swift and brutal affair, turned into a nightmare. Spanish soldiers reported seeing shadows flit through the mist. Figures draped in ancient ceremonial garb, eyes glowing with an unnatural light. These phantasmal beings offered no violence, only a silent, spectral watch over the invaders. The Spaniards, once confident in their conquest, began to waver, their minds unraveling as the fog seemed to seep into their very souls. By dawn, the city remained unconquered, and the Spanish forces withdrew leaving Mexico City in eerie silence, as if the very air held its breath, waiting. August 27, 1813 AD, the Battle of Dresden, a key engagement in the Napoleonic Wars, saw 
the armies of Europe clash in a torrential downpour. As cannons roared and men fell, a sudden stillness gripped the battlefield. The rain stopped hanging in the air like glass beads and a profound silence fell. Soldiers on both sides froze in place, their movements arrested as if time itself had paused. Then, without warning, the city of Dresden began to fade, its grand spires and cobblestone streets dissolving into the mist. The armies, now in a stupor, watched helplessly as the city vanished before their eyes, leaving nothing but a vast, empty plain. Those who ventured into the area found no sign that Dresden had ever existed. No ruins, no remnants, not even a single stone. The battle ended not with a victory, but with a loss so profound that it shook the very foundation of reality. Dresden became a whispered legend, a city that defied the natural order, erased by forces unknown and unseen. August 28, 476 A.D., the final days of the Western Roman Empire were marked not by a dramatic clash of arms, but by an eerie, pervasive silence. As the Germanic king Odoacer marched towards Rome, the city's great walls seemed to absorb the sounds of the approaching army. Within the city, the Roman citizens carried on as though unaware, their movements slow, deliberate, as if guided by an unseen hand. When Odoacer entered the city, there was no resistance, no battle, only the sound of his footsteps echoing through the empty streets. The Emperor Romulus Augustulus, a boy ruler, sat on his throne, his eyes vacant, staring into the distance. Odoacer reached out to take the crown, but as his hand touched it, the entire palace crumbled into dust. The boy Emperor vanishing without a trace. The silence deepened as if the city itself held its breath, and when the invaders turned to leave, they found that the city of Rome no longer existed. It had faded from reality, leaving only an empty void where the eternal city once stood. August 28, 1189 A.D. The coronation of Richard I, known as Richard the Lionheart, took place under skies so black that day seemed to turn to night. As Richard approached the throne, a sudden gust of wind blew through Westminster Abbey, extinguishing every candle and leaving the vast hall in complete darkness. The assembled lords and clergy began to murmur, but their voices were quickly drowned out by a low, keening wail that seemed to emanate from the very stones of the abbey. The wail grew louder, a cacophony of voices lamenting in tongues long forgotten. Richard, unperturbed, took the crown, but as it was placed upon his head, the wailing ceased, replaced by a deafening silence. The air grew cold and the gathered nobles could see their breath as frost began to creep across the stone floor. The coronation ended in haste, but from that day forward, Richard was haunted by spectral visions, pale figures that followed him into battle, their hollow eyes filled with sorrow. His reign, though marked by bravery, was also shadowed by a relentless sense of impending doom as if the wails of his coronation foretold a fate he could not escape. August 28, 1845 A.D. As tensions between the United States and Mexico escalated, a fleet of American warships appeared off the coast of Veracruz. The Mexican defenders, poised for battle, watched as the ships approached, their silhouettes ominous against the horizon. But... As the first cannon fired, the sky darkened unnaturally, and a dense fog rolled in from the sea, enveloping the fleet. The cannonballs never struck. They simply vanished into the mist. The defenders strained to see through the thick haze, but the ships were gone, replaced by ghostly apparitions. Ships of an ancient design, 
their sails tattered and crewed by skeletal figures. The Phantom Fleet sailed silently into the harbor, passing through the defensive chain as if it did not exist. The Mexican forces, gripped by terror, could do nothing as the ghostly armada docked, its crew disembarking and walking through the streets of Veracruz without a sound. By morning, the mist had lifted and the city was found abandoned. Its inhabitants vanished as though they had never been. The American fleet, unaware of what had transpired, arrived to find a ghost town. The only evidence of life, a single word, scratched into the stone of the governor's palace. Vanished. August 29th, 70 AD. As the Roman legions besieged Jerusalem, the city's walls stood firm, refusing to crumble under the relentless assault. But within the city, something far more insidious began to take hold. The stones of Jerusalem, ancient and weathered, began to weep. At first, it was a slow trickle. Dark, viscous tears seeping from the cracks in the walls. The residents, already driven to desperation by famine and war, were at first too preoccupied to notice. But as the days wore on, the weeping intensified, the stones sobbing in a low, mournful tone that echoed through the city streets. Those who touched the tears found their hands stained, the substance clinging to their skin like tar. The weeping grew louder, more sorrowful, until the entire city was engulfed in a cacophony of grief. The Romans, upon breaching the city gates, were met not by a final stand, but by a desolate, abandoned city. The inhabitants had vanished, leaving behind only the weeping stones, their tears pooling in the streets. When the Romans attempted to enter the temple, they found it sealed, the doors fused shut by the same dark substance. No force could open them, and the legion, shaken by the eerie silence and the pervasive sense of mourning, withdrew, leaving Jerusalem to its endless weeping. August 29th, 1350 A.D. In a small village in northern Italy, the plague known as the Black Death had already claimed most of the population. On this day, as the sun set, the few remaining villagers gathered in the church, hoping for solace in prayer. But as night fell, a strange music began to play, soft at first, barely audible, but growing louder with each passing minute. The music was unlike anything they had ever heard a haunting melody that seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere at once. The villagers felt an uncontrollable urge to move, to dance. They tried to resist, but their bodies betrayed them, and soon the entire congregation was dancing, their movements frenzied and wild. The music grew faster, more discordant, and the dancers began to laugh a high, unnatural sound that echoed through the empty streets. They danced through the night, their bodies twisting and contorting in unnatural ways, their laughter turning to screams as the sun began to rise. By morning, the village was silent. The church was empty, save for the tattered remains of the villagers' clothes strewn across the floor. No bodies were ever found and the village was soon abandoned, its name erased from all maps. The Dance of the Black Death, a dark legend whispered in the shadows. August 29th, 1883 A.D. The volcano Krakatoa erupted with a force that should have shattered the world. The sky turned black and the air was filled with ash and fire. But instead of the expected explosion, there was silence. A deep, profound silence that blanketed the earth like a shroud. The people in the surrounding areas, expecting to be consumed by the cataclysm, found themselves frozen in place, unable to hear, unable to move. The sea withdrew, not in a roaring wave, but in a slow, 
deliberate manner, as if the ocean itself was holding its breath. When it returned, it brought with it not destruction, but a strange shimmering mist that spread across the land, turning everything it touched to stone. The once lush islands around Krakatoa became barren, lifeless sculptures, their inhabitants preserved in eerie stillness. Ships that had been sailing nearby were found encased in crystal, their crews frozen at their posts, eyes wide with terror for years. The region remained silent, a dead zone where no sound could penetrate and those who ventured too close were lost, swallowed by the unnatural quiet. Krakatoa became a forbidden place, a monument to a disaster that defied the very laws of nature. August 30th, 1797 AD, the French revolutionary forces intent on aiding the Irish rebellion dispatched a fleet under General Hoach to land in Ireland and incite revolt against British rule. As the fleet neared the Irish coast, a dense fog enveloped the ship so thick that visibility was reduced to mere feet. The crew, tense but determined, pressed on, guided by the dim glow of their lanterns. Then, as quickly as the fog had appeared, it lifted, revealing nothing but an empty sea. The ships were gone. No wreckage, no survivors, no sign that they had ever existed. Panic spread through the ranks of the remaining French forces, who had been expecting word of the landing. Days turned into weeks, and rumors began to circulate that the fleet had been claimed by the sea itself, swallowed by a void where time and space twisted upon themselves. Some claimed to hear the voices of the lost sailors on the wind, their cries echoing across the waves. The British, baffled by the disappearance, found their own sailors refusing to venture into those waters, whispering of a cursed sea where ships vanished without a trace. The Irish rebellion faltered without the promised French support, and the mysterious vanishing of the Armada became a tale told in hushed tones, a warning of the perils of the unknown. August 30th, 1871 A.D. In the bustling port city of Yokohama, Japan, an inexplicable darkness began to descend just after midday. The sun, still high in the sky, was obscured by a thick, inky blackness that spread rapidly, casting the city into night. Panic set in as the darkness deepened and with it came a chilling cold that seeped into the bones of every living creature. Those caught outside in the blackness soon found themselves unable to move, their limbs stiffening as if turned to stone. Those who fled indoors were not spared. The shadows inside their homes began to move, shifting and writhing with a life of their own. Soon, screams echoed through the city as the shadows reached out, dragging people into the darkness, their bodies disappearing without a trace. By the time the sun returned, Yokohama was a ghost town, its streets littered with belongings hastily abandoned, its buildings silent and empty. The few survivors who managed to escape the city spoke of shadowy figures that moved with unnatural speed, their touch cold as death. Yokohama was quarantined, its name erased from official records, the shadow plague, a secret buried deep within the annals of history. August 30th, 1923 AD, deep in the heart of Sussex, a small village was preparing for the harvest festival. The townsfolk were busy decorating the square when the wind began to stir, carrying with it a strange, almost imperceptible sound, a whisper, soft and insistent, that seemed to come from the surrounding woods. At first, the villagers dismissed it as the wind through the trees, but as the day wore on, the whispers grew louder, more distinct. They spoke in an ancient tongue, long forgotten yet somehow understood by all who heard them. The whispers, 
called to the villagers, luring them into the dense forest that bordered the town. One by one, they ventured into the woods, their faces blank, eyes glazed with a trance-like calm. The sun set, but the villagers did not return. Search parties sent into the woods found only footprints leading deeper into the forest, which grew denser and darker the further they went, until the path was swallowed by an unnatural fog. The searchers returned empty-handed, the whispers echoing in their minds long after they left the forest. By morning, the village was deserted, the streets eerily quiet, the harvest left untouched. The Whispering Woods became a place of fear, its borders marked with warnings, and those who wandered too close claimed to hear the voices still calling from the depths. August 31st, 1422 A.D. As the Hundred Years' War raged on, the town of Meaux in France found itself under siege. The English forces, led by the Duke of Bedford, had surrounded the city, and tensions ran high. On this day, a strange phenomenon occurred that would haunt the survivors for generations. At dawn, the sky above Mo turned a deep, unnatural red, as if the heavens themselves were bleeding. As the sun rose, the first drops of rain began to fall, thick crimson droplets that stained the cobblestones and soaked into the earth. The rain fell steadily throughout the day, covering the town in a red sheen. The English soldiers, already on edge, began to whisper of omens and curses, while within the city walls, the French defenders prayed for deliverance. But as the day wore on, the rain showed no signs of stopping. The streets of Mo ran red with the strange liquid which clung to everything it touched, leaving a sticky residue that refused to wash away. The townspeople who came into contact with the rain soon fell ill, their skin breaking out in painful blisters that oozed the same crimson fluid. By nightfall, the town was in chaos, the defenders too weak to continue the fight, and the English too terrified to press their advantage. The siege was lifted the following day, the English retreating in fear, leaving Mo to its grisly fate. The crimson rain was never explained, and those who survived spoke of it in hushed tones, fearing that to speak of it too loudly would summon it again. August 31st, 1839, 80. The people of Charleston, South Carolina, were no strangers to hurricanes. They had weathered many storms, but nothing could have prepared them for what came on this day. The morning was calm, with a strange stillness in the air that made even the birds uneasy. Then, without warning, the wind began to howl. Not the deafening roar of a typical hurricane, but a low, mournful wail that seemed to come from the earth itself. The skies darkened, and the ocean receded as if being drawn into the mouth of a giant beast. But when the storm arrived, it did so in silence. The winds whipped through the streets at impossible speeds, yet there was no sound, no crashing waves, no shattering glass, only the eerie oppressive silence that hung over the city like a shroud. Buildings crumbled, trees were uprooted, and the harbor was torn apart, but all in a ghostly quiet that left the survivors in a state of shock. When the storm finally passed, the city lay in ruins, the once vibrant port reduced to rubble. The people who lived through it found themselves unable to speak of the event, their voices hoarse and strained as if the silence had seeped into their very bones. For years after, Charleston was known as the Silent City, a place where even the whisper of the wind was met with fear. August 31st, 1916 A.D. In the midst of World War I, the Battle of the Somme was one of the bloodiest conflicts ever witnessed 
On this day, the battlefield was transformed in a way that defied all understanding. As night fell, the soldiers on both sides noticed a strange glow emanating from the ground. At first, it was thought to be flares or some new weapon. But as the light grew brighter, it became clear that it was something else entirely. The soil, soaked with the blood of thousands, began to emit a soft, greenish-blue phosphorescence, casting an eerie glow across the battlefield. The light illuminated the shattered landscape, revealing the ghastly remnants of the day's fighting, broken bodies, twisted metal, and the turned earth of no man's land. But there was something else, too. Shapes that moved just beyond the edge of vision. Figures that seemed to flicker in and out of existence. Their outlines shimmering in the unnatural light. The soldiers, hardened by months of war, found themselves gripped by an unexplainable terror. As if the very ground beneath them was alive, haunted by the spirits of the dead. The phosphorescence lingered for days slowly fading as the battle raged on. But those who witnessed it would never forget the sight of the glowing fields, the spectral figures, and the feeling that something far older than the war itself had been awakened beneath the Somme.